Hi, this is the advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of the completeherbalguide.com. This is Thank Dr. You. Christine Sawyer, and she is a German trained physician and neuropath, and she's working as holistic brain and mental health professional, coach, educator, and consultant. Her main goal is to work with people, fight and overcome depression, and she has different programs that she's going to tell us about today that um, help people with d depression. So, um, Christine, why don't you introduce yourself and let people know what you're all about? Hi, folks. So, as you said wonderfully, Stacy, I have a quite a background. I'm not just a physician, a naturopath, a gastrointestinal and disease master specialist. I'm on Dr. Daniel Amen's teaching team and a few other things. But as I always say, all those qualifications in the end mean nothing if it doesn't help the person sitting in front of you or on the other side of the screen. So my own story of overcoming depression and uh, physical pain, I was in chronic back pain, really illustrates what's wrong in our current mental health system and how we can make it better for us, those we love and those, the, the world at large, because isn't that the purpose that most of us have to make a small difference in this world, to make yes. it a little bit better. Yes, definitely. Now you have a wonderful story. Now what made you, you were on one specific path, uh, path in your life when you were a physician, you were focusing on different things. What made you change your career around and focus on depression as your main goal? The thing that happened is I was a physician, naturopath, a family doctor, dermatologist, allergologist in Germany. Mm -hmm. I worked in my ex-husband's family practice day and night. We did night shifts. We did house calls. That's what family doctors do in Germany or did then. That was over 20 years ago. And then I became a dermatologist and allergologist at my own practice. So I worked 16, 18 hours a day. Way too wow. much for anybody that is human like myself, especially when they have kids on top of it. Yes. So something's got to give. It was too much. Yes. So my back told me basically by a uh, ruptured disc, you can do that. Mm -hmm. I ended up in the hospital learning to walk again. Wow. That was humiliating enough to have to use a pee bucket, basically. Uh, then I did a rehab program, learned to walk again, started working again. Whoops, the second disc slipped. Oh, wow. And that was really too much. I gave up. My ex-husband, who struggled with mental illness too, as I have done since I was 14, uh, he ended up committing suicide. Oh, wow. And I was left Sorry. with two teenage sons in the middle of our immigration process to Canada. Wow. So I decided, let's just finish what we started, go to Canada. Maybe the kids will have a good life. And right. let's see what is Canada about. Yeah. So we went to Halifax and it was 25 years ago. Wow. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing. I was already in chronic pain and I was depressed because I had lost what made my life then valuable. Right. Helping others, having a profession that would fulfill me and make me happy. So I fell myself in a deep depression and I tried to commit suicide. Oh. And that was when a small inner voice woke up in myself and told me, hey, you really don't want to die. You need help. Right. And I did what then was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I did ask for help. I went, I drove myself to the emergency room. I was so desperate. I said, it's the only way out. I, I don't care anymore. And I was even more fortunate because the resident recognized how bad I was and committed me to the mental hospital here in Halifax, where I stayed for four weeks and a very long time. Yeah. And then my fortune hit again. I was transitioned into a six-week day hospital. It's a group psychotherapy program, interdisciplinary. It was extremely good. It actually helped me change a few of my beliefs and started the path to existence. Of course, I was on heavy antidepressants, medication, and the whole enchilada. So I was struggling along, struggling along. In the meantime, I met my current husband. We are now together 25 years, wonderful oh. person. 
Congratulations. He English. <laughs> no, I knew English before, but he taught me how to speak English in a way that doesn't come over as rude, like many Germans do when they try to translate. <laughs> German is uh, not for nothing considered to be a rough language, and it is. <laughs> when I translate a uh, verbatim from German to English, English people tend to think I'm rude, which I try not to be. I usually am not. And so he taught me that and he taught me to be outgoing. At that point, I was extremely shy, which people that know me now can't believe. So I'm a classic example. People can change. But at that point, I was still extremely struggling. I was back and forth out of the hospitals, depressed in psychiatric care, medication added up. My brain was foggy. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a purpose. I struggled around. I didn't know what to do. I tried some tax preparation. I learned a lot, but it's not passion right so after about 10 years of struggle finally it hit me at one point you're getting older is mm -hmm. that the life that you always wanted right. is that what you were dreaming of all of your days when you were a little kid you yeah. were dreaming of helping people and now you're sitting here watching tv is that what you always wanted to do with your life right so at that moment it hit me like a flash bolt of lightning and i said Shit, that's not what I want to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> that was a real turning point. That decision. Yeah. The decision for change. The pain was so bad. I just didn't want to live like that anymore. I right. didn't want to exist. I wanted to thrive. So then I said, I know a lot already. So I learned a little bit extra mm -hmm. <laughs> as I did. And I actually became healthy again and then and i emphasize the sequence first you get yourself well with all kinds of combination of methods and right. then you're in a position when you can slowly get rid of your psychiatric medications which i did i was in three different ones clonazepam seroquel and uh, another one uh, yeah an antidepressant yeah. so it, it wasn't good so i got myself with Within two years, and Dr. Bregan's excellent book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, slowly off them against the advice of my psychiatrist, funny enough. Uh, and uh, I'm well. I'm well now for four or five years without medication. Excellent. The psychiatrist can't believe it. Yeah. We had a social meeting not long ago, and I made a little bit fun of him. And I said, don't you like to see your patients get well? And he said, well, I don't see that that often. And I said, you ever think about why that is? <laughs> you have an answer for that. And that's what I'm trying to do now. I founded my business a few years back, uh, trying to help people with a similar story to get better. And that's what many coaches do, take advantage of their pre-existing knowledge and experience right. and it with their own story and their expertise in that area. Right. And their understanding how it really feels from the inside out to be in that position. Most physicians, most psychologists have no idea what it feels like to be on the door of wanting to kill yourself. Right. I don't say everyone, some do. So that inspired me. And then I looked for some kind of a framework that I could apply. And there was none. There was certain things. And that, so that's what I do in my head. Uh, my brain spins around and sometimes something spits out that is interesting and maybe even valuable to others. So that's how I came up with my seven step sparkle strategy. Mm -hmm. And actually a business coach, Melanie Godlava, she came up uh, together with me with the sparkles. And I like, like it because what do we do when somebody's happy? The ice sparkle, we have a yeah. the step, the smile. Very true. So, hey, we cover your sparkle. We all have a sparkle when we are children. Yes. And we lose it. We are made to lose it. Mm -hmm. And we can recover it. I think that's great. You know, how, when it's, you know, there's millions of people that suffer from depression and millions of people will experience depression at least once in their life. Now, when people fall into depression, it's like falling into a hole, like a six foot hole underground. How does a person who, you know, because they get very depressed, they sleep a lot, they disassociate themselves from the ones they care about and love, their moods might change. How, how does a person like get out of that hole? 
And how do they want to get out of that hole? Because when you're depressed, sometimes they lose the enthusiasm to want to get better. They just give up on life. What's the first step of getting out of that hole? I think the first step is to be in enough pain to want to change. Right. And it requires pain. And that's why it's sometimes dangerous to just cover it up with medication. Yes. Because then patients uh, or people that feel depressed and are in the hole, the medication just make them not feel the pain of being stuck in the hole in the tunnel, exactly. the darkness of, of their existence. And they think that it's supposed to be that way. That's their new life. And there's nothing better out there. And that is so sad. But most of them, at some point, they get a glimpse. Be it that they go out at night and they look up and there's the this, this sky with the sparkly stars. Yeah. And they think, oh my God, I remember when I was a child, those stars, they meant something to me. There's something yeah. up there. What could it be? Isn't there something more than just sitting in the dark hole? Yeah. Watching Netflix or whatever all day. And at some point they realize, oh, maybe there is something. Maybe I should look for something else. Right. And that's the first step. Because me personally, when I had my daughter, my second pregnancy, I had went through postpartum depression. And the doctor said he was going to put me on a temporary medication. And I remember experiencing when I was on that medication, my insides, my emotions went numb. Someone could, you know, die in front of me and I probably wouldn't even have emotion. He goes, oh, that's so sad. And I told him, I don't like feeling like this. I can't feel anything. I have no emotion. So he put me on another medication and it wasn't as severe, but it made me, it just numbed my emotions, which I did not like. Eventually he weaned me off and I was fine. But those medications just numb you inside, like you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, you know, because every, you know, I see it so much. People suffer from anxiety. They suffer from depression. And the first thing that the doctor does is write them a prescription and, and explain to the audience because they take these pres subscriptions because they want to feel better. They don't want to feel depressed. They want to move on with their life, but explain to them what these medications are really doing to them and the outcome, the negative outcome that could happen from it. Those medications will change your brain chemistry and they will change it uh, if you don't, if you take them long enough uh, for a very long time. Yes, your yeah. brain is plastic. It can change back, but it takes also a very long time to change back. Right. And I know it because I was on three different run for 10, 10 years and it changed my brain and it wasn't good. Yeah. And uh, it took me five, six years by now. My brain is nearly as good as it was when I was young. Not 100%. I'm still working on it. It's right. a constant way to improve your brain health because brain health and mental health are together. Right. Like brother and sister. Yes. What those medications do, they just numb your feeling. And it's the same thing as, as if you had a splinter in your toe and you would just take a Tylenol or aspirin for the pain. Right. The splinter right. is still there. If you don't pull it out, it will start to fester and fester. And you need to feel it. There's people born without physical pain. It's a very severe handicap. Those right. children die early. Imagine you had appendicitis and your stomach wouldn't hurt. Yeah. It would rupture and you would die. So pain is a very important important signal of the body that you need to change something and in the physical realm when you break an arm it's a sign hey that arm you need to not use it for a while it has to right. heal and the same in your brain when you have emotional mental pain it's a sign there's something wrong in your life and you need to do some changing and sometimes i get it if the pain is so overwhelming, you want to take something. And it's okay for a short time. Yeah. I I don't think it's good for the long time. And there's actually good meta-analysis that came out now in PubMed that antidepressants do not increase the quality of life of people with depression. Right. Now, of course. Isn't it something? You it, know it. it. I, and I believe it because, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, when I had postpartum depression from the, from the pregnancy, it didn't, I was not happy. Mm. It didn't make me feel better. It just numbed the emotion. Yeah. So I wouldn't feel more depressed, but the depression was still there. 
I just, you know, it, I just couldn't feel it was, it was a terrible feeling for me personally. It was like, you didn't feel emotion. So you couldn't really relate to the individuals around you. You were just kind of like numb in, in a world where you just walked around with no emotions. And how is that supposed to make you feel better? You know, you know, it, it's, you know, it may, it may numb or suppress the depression, but it's not improving your quality of life in any way. No. And, and I, I found it very interesting when I read that on Medscape, it's a website for doctors and they said experts surprised. And I thought really experts are surprised that they don't increase. What are those experts anyway? Right. I worked on a conference with Dr. David Burns, by the way, he wrote the book, feeling good and feeling great. I greatly recommend those for anybody depressed. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a team therapist level one with him. So I was on a webinar with him together with 200 others. And he said, I've been a psychiatrist for 35 years. For 30 years, I haven't prescribed a single antidepressant because I think they are not necessary. Right. Now that from a psychiatrist that wrote books about depression. If he doesn't know what he's saying, I don't know who does. There are other ways. Now, what are those other ways? The other ways are sometimes complex, sometimes easy. For some people, they need to go on short-term medication because the pain is so overwhelming that they are otherwise wanting to commit suicide. And sometimes it's okay to be in a hospital for a few weeks or days or whatever. But then the healing has to start. And in my opinion, it needs to start with a holistic health assessment of all five dimensions of health. What's going on? in your physical health. Most depressed people and anxious people have also gut issues, IBS, colitis, bloating, diarrhea, anything. It's, I think half of the people that have depression have something wrong with their gut. We know the gut brain axis it has mm -hmm. to do with each other. So that mm -hmm. needs to be assessed and later fixed. Then we need to look at the thought patterns, the emotional patterns. And that is in part determined by the way people grow up, but also in part of other influences that we subject ourselves. Who right. have, do we have as partners, the relationships, that's the social health, the third dimension. Then there's a spiritual connection. Many people do not have one and they just end up getting distracted all over. But 80% of people believe there's something out there, some kind of energy or God. Mm -hmm. And I myself and was an atheist until I was depressed and after, and then I said, hmm, something is out there. I, I'm, I'm not in a, I, I grew up evangelical. Uh, it's not my religion anymore. I respect anybody that chooses it, of course. Right. But I believe more in the universal energy or love. I think it's all the same. Yes. My I'm brother will be vehemently oppose me, always says I'm going to hell very gentle but that's him okay yeah. i can live with it and i don't believe it by the way for anybody that worries about going to hell i don't right. believe there is a hell except for in your own head on earth that you right. create yourself i agree and, <laughs> and then we have a social dimension the relationship with us and then i added the fifth dimension the financial health because if somebody is really struggling with their finances how can they be mentally healthy? That's a major stressor. And yes. long-term stress that is not balanced by uh, relaxation, it has to be homeostasis. If that's not balanced, yeah. you create depression. Yes. You create anxiety. And then the gut health changes and it all goes together in a downward spiral. And yeah. you end up in the dark hole. Right. So the way out starts with that holistic health assessment. Mm -hmm. And then you can start making a plan. I love life plans. A good mm -hmm. life plan that includes strategies for all five dimensions. And then you have to implement them one after another. Now, where does a person go to get a holistic health assessment? Well, they can obviously go to my website. I mm -hmm. do that. It's uh, docchristine.com and there's uh, you can go to the services part and get it. Uh, some other practitioners do it. You can see an integrative uh, functional psychiatrist. Dr. Mm -hmm. Greenblatt is a, is a good one. Dr. Daniel Amen and the Amen Clinics do that. I can refer people there, by the way, and they get a discount. Uh, 
excellent options. There are options out there. Uh, your typical doctor, even the naturopath, will not be able to do it, and they are not specializing on mental health. Right. I've seen it over and over. They're good willing. They try, but they don't know the details. Right. There are special tests sometimes that help enormously find out the biochemistry biochem behind depression, like an organic acid test. Mm -hmm. Or I love the omega-3-6 ratio, so important for brain health and, and, and stuff like that. Or sometimes it's a food sensitivity issue. And mm -hmm. Julia Matthews has extensively done research about the con connection between uh, the biochemistry, food and the brain. Yes. With children with autism, ADHD, and it mm -hmm. can all be helped. And I don't know why mainstream does not want to recognize it. I think it's just not suitable for the big corporations that support most of mainstream medicine. Right. I agree with you. You know, and, and if you see that ADHD and a lot of these illnesses are on the rise, why are they on the rise? Why is it so prevalent in today's society? It wasn't as prevalent when we were growing up. And I don't think it was a not lack of knowledge. I think a lot of it has to do too, like you said, with the different foods, the different ways, you know, um, you know, they're approaching these illnesses, you know, um, you know, there are certain foods that will change your brain chemistry, you know, um, you know, people don't realize, you know, uh, you know, what these foods can do, even when they came out with cigarettes back in the day. You know, they had an addictive substance in the cigarette to make you order, your brain become automatically addicted to it that nobody knew about, you know, and in and some foods, we have the same types of ingredients that makes you feel addictive or, help, you know, or worsen your focus, you know, and, uh, you know, these are things that you have to look out for as well. Absolutely. The food industry creates food that make you addictive. Uh, I mean, some sugary foods are engineered to make you Crave them. Yes. And uh, I, I work on that too, because it's very important to reduce those cravings. And there's ways with certain amino acids to do that. Right. But that said, I think ADHD is also created sometimes by too early exposure to screens. Mm -hmm. Small children should never be exposed to cell phone, video games, TV, before five, they shouldn't watch TV at all. Maybe half an hour a day max. Right. Most do much more. And the more TV or similar screens a child under six watches, Dr. Eamon did a very good study about that. For each hour of uh, doing screen time for kids under five, it, it adds 10% to the likelihood that they are diagnosed with ADHD by age six. Right. So as parents, we can do a lot to keep our kids from becoming unfocused. Right. Keep them focused on playing without a screen that's constantly changing. Yes. Keep them focused on building something. Right. Blocks, Lego, crayons, doing a craft where they are actually engaged. The sad thing is you can't use that kind of thing as a babysitter. <laughs> it doesn't have the same addictive qualities as a screen. Right. See kids all the time. They're on screens for hours and hours and they're addicted. And sometimes the parents give in because they want to give take it away from the kids. And then the kids get upset. Right. And the worst thing you can do when a kid gets upset to say, okay, 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 let them do it. It's yeah. worse. That's worse. That is true. That and then the kids true. get older and on top of ADHD, they get diagnosed with uh, ODD. <laughs> Oppositional defiant disorder. Well, it's yeah. a parenting problem, not a medical disease that starts early. Yes. It's so sad. It is. I heard sometimes. And, you know, I also, you know, when people who have depression, when sometimes when it gets chronic, people give up on life. And you notice that, you know, depression could lead to suicide. And a lot, and a lot of, especially when it comes to certain illnesses or it comes to certain mental disorders, you know, um, in certain, in certain communities, the suicide rate is up and it's higher. Now, as from a family perspective, are there any signs? You know, I've known people, you know, that I've met in the course of my years coaching that have had a, a son or a daughter commit suicide and they felt guilty because they didn't recognize any of the signs, but sometimes, you know, they're powerless in these situations. But 
is there any specific signs that a family member living in that household or even outside that household can you know recognize and maybe try to approach or get help them try to get the right help? Well, sometimes there is, not in every case, but sometimes there is. And uh, sometimes it's just that the children become withdrawn. They don't want to talk no more. They lose interest in activities of every day. And if a child or anybody talks about suicide, it's not that they don't want to do it. It's because they're thinking about it and they're considering doing it. Right. This needs to be taken seriously and oh yeah no no don't do it that doesn't work it makes them just retreat and not talk about it right I think it is very important to talk about it and say why are you considering it? what's going on what's what's bothering you so much and if your child for example gets bullied on the computer cyberbullying well there's an off switch on the computer use it yes and you notice a lot of kids, a lot of kids have committed suicide or fell into depression because of the bully and the cyber bully mm. on the internet. You know, people can get very mean and they don't realize how badly they can affect another individual's life. And sometimes they just don't care because they themselves feel so miserable that they just lash out. And it's easy yeah. to lash out online when you don't know the other party. And why should you care about somebody that you don't even know? Right. Right. And and when parents let their kids have unlimited screen time without supervision, they do not do them a favor. Right. So, you know, when it comes to um, suicide, so it's just a myth. Sometimes I hear what they say is if they're talking about it, then that means that they're 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 not that that, that it's it's not really in their head. They're just looking for attention. So it's the opposite. The opposite is true. Somebody that talks about suicide thinks about it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I know my ex-husband, he talked about suicide hundreds of times and how often mm -hmm. did I have to talk him down and uh, he ended up committing suicide because sometimes a despair in a person is just so deep. Yeah. And they do not want help sometimes too. Right. So it's sad, but uh, if it's a child, it's often a communication issue. And Yes, I understand the parents' guilt. I felt guilty for a while too about my ex committing suicide because I wasn't there to talk him down and he wrote a, a, a goodbye letter blaming me of all people. And, and you do feel guilty about the suicide of a loved one. But yeah. let me tell you, it's never your fault. Right. Because we all as humans, I assume, try the best we can at the time. Yeah. And we live and learn. And sometimes that learning process is painful. Yes. But pain is a great teacher. It is a great teacher. It definitely is. And can you explain that a little further to the audience? Why pain is such a great teacher sometimes? Well, pain makes you aware that things are not right. Right. And there's change needed. And then it's time for you to go into yourself. Mm-hmm. Sit with yourself and not the TV. Right. <laughs> and not distract yourself and not stuff yourself with food or alcohol, but just sit with yourself. Maybe do some journaling. There's mm -hmm. lots of great journals available. I know you have one. I have <laughs> one. There's, I love it. There's lots of great journals available. And you can just take a piece of paper and write it down. Creative writing is so therapeutic because it forces you to put the thoughts that are in your brain on paper and then you see it and I said really am I thinking that crap right you read it again and then you can say to yourself this is not quite accurate thinking maybe I should talk with somebody right about how I can change something in that process that's gone wrong for me and I know so many people that are embarrassed to talk about it what do you tell these people that are embarrassed to tell somebody else how they're feeling inside that they're they they don't want to really be you know they feel insecure what is this person going to think about me if they really know what I, I'm thinking right now mm. what do you tell that person I was one of them I I totally get it uh yeah if you think they won't like me when I tell them that I really feel so miserable 
I, that I'm not happy. I have that smile on my face, but deep below I'm crying and yeah. I'm trying so hard to keep it together and nobody knows. And if I tell them they won't like me, maybe they will even laugh about me. They reject me, a universal human thing, especially when you're in a helping profession. And that's why the suicide rate about doctors and nurses is one of the highest generally. Yeah. It is absolutely impossible because it doesn't be safe. Physician, help yourself. Well, it doesn't work. Let me tell you, it does not work. You right. cannot pull yourself out of a mud hole. Yes. And it's actually not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's a sign of courage. Right. It takes a lot of courage. I didn't have the courage for all of my childhood. And I got frustrated a few times trying it during my adult life. I, I tried to talk to people and they just didn't get it. Yeah. And that's frustrating too and discouraging and drives people deeper in depression. But don't give up. Right. You will find the right person. And in this time and day, you can watch shows like this. You can watch podcasts and maybe you connect, you can watch videos on YouTube. And maybe you see somebody that you say, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe yeah. I should reach out to them. Right. And even if you reach out by email, text or whatever you can, reach out to someone and tell them how you feel and that but, you need help. Don't just give up. Yes. I was going to just say that. Just don't give up because sometimes when you go to a therapist or if you go to a coach, you might not connect with that person's personality. They might not see things eye to eye like you, but that doesn't mean that there's not anybody else out there that they should keep trying. Just like, you know, if you're going to go for a second opinion, you may not like what the first doctor says. It's, it's okay to go for, you know, another opinion and to, to, until you find that right person you can connect to. How do you feel about that? Absolutely. My worst experience ever in my journey with depression was when I was 19 and a young student in medical school. I was very depressed. So I went to the student psychological service. I was assigned a psychologist, supposedly. I think he was a student, whatever. So I sat in the room, cameras on. I had written a long story why I need help, but I couldn't talk about it at that point. Right. So I sat there, waited for him to say something, start a conversation. And the whole hour, that man said nothing. He just sat there and I couldn't talk. I said to myself, <sighs> say something so I can reply. I want you to say, and he yeah. did nothing. So for 60 minutes, literally, I <laughs> sat there and he sat there not saying anything. And right. I was eaten myself, right and left inside. I felt worse than ever after that session, whatever it was, it was miserable. Yeah. So at that point, don't give up. Go see somebody else that will talk if you can talk. Right. Or will read what you read and respond to it in a reasonable way. Right. That was miserable, I tell you. Yeah, you know, I it, it takes time to find the right person. But once mm -hmm. you find that right person, I think they can provide, you know, a lot of times the tools and knowledge from an outside perspective. And it could be very beneficial, I think so. Don't you think so? Absolutely. I've met very nice and caring and good psychologists. I've met caring psychiatrists. I've met miserable, um, I won't say the B word. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've met miserable psychiatrists that just are interested in pushing drugs. But there's good ones out there too. Yes. And there's good family doctors. There are some that don't. There's good people. There's good coaches. There's coaches that don't care. There's coaches that don't know what they're doing, but pretend. Right. So always check the background. I actually wrote a blog post on my site about it. Uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, life coach, who should I use for mental health support? Why I detail what you should look for in yeah. a coach, psychologist, psychiatrist, before you get to there and buy. Excellent. So, so, you, so you know what not to do or what to look for. Because a lot of people don't know what to look for, you know, you know, it takes enough of courage just to get there. But, you know, sometimes you don't know what to look for. People don't know where to start. And what I found, too, is a lot of people, when doctors give them medications, sometimes they overdose themselves and they start taking more medicine than they're supposed to. And I found that I've seen people, you know, so drugged up that they can't even get out of their beds, you know. And have you seen that in some patients also? Yeah, that happens. And sometimes the doctors overprescribe. Sometimes the patient take it wrong. And uh, 
sometimes the medications are just not right for that type of depression, ADD right. or anxiety that they have, because there are several types. It's not all one lump sum depression thing. There are several different types depending on your brain type. Now, what what's the first like? What's the first step? Like, if you had to give people tips that they know they're not feeling happy, if they feel depressed but they don't know where to start, what would you tell them? Step one: This is what you should do. Step one: Go on, Mister Google, good old Mister Google, and search for your symptoms and help for it. But don't stop on the first side. Of course, if you land on my side, you can stop and look into it. I have a few really nice blog posts. And if they appeal to you, if you like the tone, I like the fun too, but I also can be very serious. I'd be happy to speak with you. Most coaches offer a free call, which is an advantage over psychi psychiatrists, psychologists who usually don't. Right. You can also look on Psychology Today on those websites. I am there too, by the way. And you can look for people like, like that are halfway or really qualified to do some kind of mental health coaching, counseling, or whatever. Now you There's have many. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say you have a lot of resources. Can you tell some people the different resources you have on your website? Because I was truly, you know, amazed at some all the things that you have to offer people to help them get over depression and overcome it and to reduce their depression. Yeah, I obviously have uh, blog posts. Those are all free. And I offer a free download of the PDF version of this little uh, daily sparkle of gratitude, a journal to brighten your day. It's nice. I've been told it's different. That's nice to hear. Uh, and I like to give it away. And uh, I also have, uh, I, I'm writing on a new book, uh, Foods That Help You to Sparkle. I have a few books written on Amazon. You can look it up. But food that help you to sparkle is close to my health, my, right. my, my thing, because it's so important. And of course, mm -hmm. I love supplements because supplements often give depressed people the first energy to actually do the rest of the work. But right. they have to be the right kind of supplements, the right dosage, the right kind for your brain type. So I actually just founded the sister site supplementsformentalhealth.com because I'm so passionate about it because yeah. I myself replaced all my psychiatric medication with a supplement regimen. I'm healthy, happy, and not yet wealthy. Oh, that's excellent. I'm so happy. I'm healthy in a way that I have enough. Do you, um, is there any supplements that you could tell us about that might help people? What do you mean? Any supplements? Please, uh, any supplements that might help people with depression that might give them the energy or the focus they need? Or is there any anything that you may want to like suggest to people? Yeah. If you don't need a customized supplement strategy, and of course you can go to the supplementsformentalhealth.com website to get one for free, but if you don't need it and just need web, uh, supplements for that help you to focus, I recommend Dr. Amen's website, BrainMD. My favorite supplements. Here's my favorite, focus and energy. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Whenever I get tired, it actually works. Mm -hmm. I try everything that I recommend or I wouldn't. Yeah. Unless it's out of my realm, I wouldn't really take some stuff that is toxic, but I don't recommend that either most of the time. I find that it's it's a blend of things, like you mentioned. It's it's not just it's it's uh it's supplements, it's how you eat, spirituality, connecting with yourself. Cause I always feel like your intuition, your inner self always is telling you the right thing to do. We just have to be able to connect with ourselves and listen to what our body is, is telling us. And even like when you said that, you know, uh, the, the supplements, but also a proper lifestyle, proper sleep and, and, you know, and being able to vocalize yourself, even with my epilepsy, I didn't start healing until I started vocalizing and started talking to people. And that's when the healing process came in. I think it's great when people get enough of courage to go out there and actually talk to somebody and realize that they're not alone. There are so many communities out there that, you know, are there any that you can recommend that people could go to and maybe, you know, interact and realize that they're, they're not alone and maybe hear some stories and be able to relate to those stories? Yes. 
If you're on Facebook, there's great depression groups, of course. Some of them are very negative. Stay out of them. Uh, I have one, of course, Buckles for Mental Health. That is a positive one. And when you go to my website, click on Facebook, it takes you right there. Oh, good. Uh, but uh, uh, otherwise, sometimes there's mental health support groups locally that are good where you can meet other people yeah. that are struggling. And even if you have a church group, and sometimes when you talk to somebody in private and says, listen, I haven't been feeling good lately. I feel a little down in the dumps. And just wait. And the other person often, oh, you too. And then you realize, <laughs> oh, that's a person I always thought smiles all the time. Or you tell somebody, I'm afraid to go alone in a social situation. I have kind of a social anxiety. Most of my neighbors say, oh, yes, you too. Me too. Yes. And so the remedy for that is just hang everybody under, hook them under and take them all with you. Right. Exactly. And with anxiety of any kind, the best therapy is doing it anyway. Because one of my mentors said, and it's very wise, it's not the fear that makes your life miserable. It's the avoidance of the fear producing situations mm. that you're missing out on. Right. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Now, before we close, yeah. would you would you like to give a few a, a few tips to people or tell people some things that we didn't talk about that you might feel might be beneficial? I think the most important thing is never, ever give up. If you are right now in a dark place, never give up. That's one of my tenants. If you're in a dark tunnel, after the next bend, there's a light. That's a bright sun. It's not a freight train. I always say it's a sunshine. It's a southern sunshine that awaits you at the end of the tunnel. So you know that uh, uh, country song, when you're going to hell, just keep going. Keep <laughs> going. On the other side is the sunshine. <laughs> I love country. I love I love John Denver. Yeah. Some days are diamonds, some days are stone. I listen to it in the, in the mental health uh, facility all the time. Yeah, you know, I have I have certain music also. It's very therapeutic. I think yeah. music can be very therapeutic too. Absolutely. As well, positive music. Positive. Exactly. Your, your karma, reflective. Not music that makes you positive. Now, are you a big believer in positive thinking? Are you, you know, do you share that in your programs? That's a good question. What does positive thinking mean? If it means just saying to yourself, I'm happy when you can't believe it. No, I'm a fan of realistic thinking. You'll find something that is more positive and that your brain can believe. Right. So if you're not happy right now, you can maybe say to yourself, I think I'll maybe happy someday. That's a place to start. And then you can work on that until mm -hmm. you're at a place where you honestly can, can say to yourself, I'm happy and believe it. I think that's great. I think that's great, you know, because uh, it, it, it's very important to have, be, have realisticness and then no fantasy and desire. They're two different areas and to focus on the realistic and to say, you know, like you said, and I want to be happy someday. You know, that's yeah. realistic. You can be happy someday. You can be. I will be. And, and you know, happiness is relative, as you know. And one of my favorite books, by the way, is Viktor Frankl's Men's Search for Meaning. Oh. We all need meaning in our life. Yes. A purpose, right. a passion, meaning to live a fulfilled life. I always say people are only afraid to die because they haven't lived. Yes. Yes. Very true. So Victor Frankl survived the concentration camps. Mm. And he invented a therapy. He was a psychiatrist before the Second World War and after the Second World War. He invented a therapy called logotherapy. That means... Helping people to find meaning. Oh, I, love I heard that. him as a young medical student. What a event. That is amazing. I love His that. His book, Man's Search for Meaning. Very much recommended. Great book. Oh, I, I, I like that. I think I actually might start reading that book because that sounds amazing. Because that is so true. You know, we all have to have meaning in our life. What's life if we don't have meaning? And here's the example of a person that found meaning as a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. That is unbelievable. 
Now, can you just tell everybody once again where they can find your website and all the great things that we were talking about that you offer on your website? Thank you. The best place to start is just go to docchristine.com. So the website is D-O-C-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E.com. Like my name with the doc before it, or you can Google my name and something with me will pop up. <laughs> uh, I'm all over the place by now, which is nice to see, but uh, sometimes uh, that's okay. Go to my website. It's a good place to start and everything will be there. I list the, the best blog post right up front and there's a button to recall. You can read a little bit about my Sparkle system if you want to, or you can talk to me or you can uh, subscribe to the newsletter and see what I'm up to all the week. <laughs> Because I do a lot of different things and I have a lot of fun and interesting things I've been told. That's great. You know, I've been on your website and you do have a lot of valuable information provided to people, you know, that are going through obstacles in their life. And I thank you so much for taking the time to help people because depression is huge and a lot of things, you know, kind of umbrella under depression. So, you know, you're tackling a, a huge area that could save so many lives and improve the lives of others. So thank you so much for what you do. And I appreciate your time and for everything that you do. And I'll be sure to go, and I'm going to be sure to go on your website and I'm going to go get the, your your journal and start doing some reading some of those recommendations that you mentioned so thank you so much thank you so much stacy and it was a pleasure to be on your show and those books behind you they look appealing to me too <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't want to empower themselves there's lots of great coaches out there folks listen yes. to them go with them work with them if it's up to you go do it and I have to say, okay. I work with coaches too. And, you know, they have, you know, helped me tremendously because we all go through things in life. And for someone to say, no, they haven't, that's not true. Everybody has gone through obstacles in their life. And it's great to have someone from the outside helping you see the sparkles in your life. One of my favorite coaches, he's an executive coach, Marshall Goldsmith. He always says, we all need help. <laughs> And it's he coaches true. people like Coca-Cola executives. <laughs> it's true. The more stress you're under, you know, it's st stress, you know, is 70%, I think, or it's over 70% of stress causes illness. So, you know. Whether your stress is from the outside or from the inside. You need is, help. I need exactly. help. You all need help. I think, I think, you know, what the, everybody needs help 20, you know, the more help we have, the better people we become, you know, I think so. So if personal growth is your goal, get a coach. Yes, I agree. I agree so much. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate everything you did, Dr. Christine. You give people so much great advice. And I hope you...